What is up, party people? It's your guy, Lucky, and today we are going to be talking about X-Men 97, Easter eggs, and all the, the fun stuff of the season. I would like to let everybody know as well, this is going to be very spoiler heavy, so if you haven't finished watching season one, go wrap that up, leave the video, come back when you're done, so we can have a great discussion about it. Also, if you enjoy nerdy content like this, remember to hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and give us a like if you don't mind. We're going to be starting with some of the Easter eggs that I noticed in season one. We have Moro in the Wanted poster. She is a Morlock and she was really big in the original animated series and she got big towards the end of the animated series. So for this, I'm hoping that this is kind of them hinting at potentially her coming back in season two. Secondly, what I would like to talk about is the return of Storm's Mohawk. This was birthed in the 80s and it has kind of always been a signal to the fan base and it's really cool. When she has the Mohawk, she is less in that kind of queen with T'Challa. She's more of a loose cannon. She's more of a rebellious state when she has the mohawk that's kind of foreshadowing what happens in season one a little bit and seeing the growth of storm is really cool in this season and we'll get more into what happens in some of the other easter eggs that involve her cyclops also yells throughout season one i surrender not which is a nod to the original show the pilot episode he yells the same thing i found that kind of cool that they went back and dug that up to rehash it in the opening episode of x-men 97. one of my favorite easter eggs in episode one was the newspaper asking the question, is Spider-Man a mutant? Now, obviously us fans know that Spider-Man is a mutate, not a mutant. Different, I know. Nonetheless, this also is a nod that Spider-Man is in this universe. It's a bigger universe than just X-Men. It's not a condensed story. And we could be seeing Spider-Man return to his 90s glory. I would love to see an animated show kind of reference and go back to what he was in that. Now, one of the biggest things as well in this episode was to me my x-men which is the kind of the de facto call to action for them and it's existed since the very first comic x-men number one now it's taken different forms it has gone through different wording but nonetheless they kind of updated it and in the 90s they landed on to me my x-men so that was neat to see that brought back in the 2020s and the final thing for episode one is the concept of the last will and test of Xavier. Now this stems from a story of the same name that features the school being left to Scott, Cyclops, instead of Magneto. And in that story, basically Scott is an outcast to the X-Men because he was responsible for Xavier's death in that comic. So they took a different approach with Magneto, but I didn't mind it. And the fact that they use the same type of concept was pretty neat because a lot of my comic fans out there, like myself, remember that. And now we're going to be bouncing to a Episode two. We're gonna start off with Magneto's sleeveless purple Big M look. Now this was a look that is a callback to the 80s. Another awesome thing that we see throughout season two is a quick little scene and it is Jean showing her classic Marvel Girl costume when her and Storm are packing. This is most notably worn in the Dark Phoenix saga and the early Krakoan age stories. Another cool thing is that most of this episode is based off of Uncanny X-Men number 200 and this is the trial of Magneto. Now we know in the trial of Magneto he is on trial for his crimes against humanity and he ends up saving the judge and Xavier during his trial which leads to the judge kind of giving him a free pass a little bit but then we hop to the fact that Storm literally lost her powers and this was a multi-year event for Storm in the comics. They go a lot quicker in the show than they did in the comics with Storm which I found it fascinating at how detailed and how well they were able to pull that off with such a short little window that they did it in. I mean, I, I can't say enough good things about this show. And this, once again, comes from a multi-year arc stemming from Uncanny X-Men number 185 with Storm. So much like the show, she loses her powers. How's she gonna get them back? This season deals with that and we have more on that later. Now, I wanna bounce to episode three. One of the first things that I noticed in this episode was Cyclops, AKA Scott, and Jean's wedding photo. And that was recreated from the 
the original cover of X-Men 30. The Jean clone, Meredith, also references her actions as an Inferno. If you don't know what an Inferno is referencing, it is referencing the 1989 storyline called Inferno, where she makes a pact with Limbo to find her son, Nathan, aka Cable, and becomes the Goblin Queen, which in the show, she becomes the Goblin Queen as well, which hopefully we see her in season two as a potential villain for the X-Men moving forward. Also a cool little tidbit in episode three was Gambit spying on Magneto and Rogue. It is a direct callback to the cover of Uncanny X-Men number 274. Also the last big one that I wanna talk about Easter egg wise was in Jean's Visions, it features Uncanny X-Men number 36, Cyclops holding a dead Phoenix. And this is probably one of the most iconic pictures for X-Men fans. Moving on to episode four, one of my favorite parts of the season, we get into the Motendo console and logo. And those were modeled after the Model 1 Sega Genesis, as well as the art in it was based off of the 1993 X-Men game published by Sega. Everybody kind of remembers the 1993 X-Men game for the mission that required you to turn off your system and turn it back on. So that was really neat that they kind of shouted that out specifically, not only the game itself, but also the system was modeled up after it. This episode also alludes to a classic film in The Matrix. With the dial-up sound when Jubilee and Roberto are transported to the game, the concept of a rogue program upsetting the balance of the world, and Mojo's Morpheus quote, if you die in the game, you die in real life. Also, this part of the episode was kind of a send-up to Konami beat-up games. You know, it was 1992's X-Men and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Turtles in Time are two of the bigger ones known by Konami. The second half of episode four is based off of another X-Men comic, Uncanny X-Men number 186. Storm also throughout this episode looks noticeably uncomfortable in Forge's machine. Forge, if you don't know, is a mutant who his ability is to make anything that his mind can come up with, which is a nod to actually her origin story. She is very claustrophobic due to being stuck under rubble as a child. So now we get into episode five. Gene and Scott's story about a picnic is actually from Uncanny X-Men number 132, where Jean held back Scott's powers with her own powers. Rogue's outfit and backstory that we see in episode five is from an Uncanny X-Men story as well, where she is stranded in Savage Land with Magneto, and it's kind of the beginning of that relationship. So the Genosha Holocaust in episode five, it happened in the first arc of Grant Morrison's new X-Men run, and I found the similarities between it very cool in its own way it's almost kind of graphic and this nods to Magneto's past as well because if you know about Magneto's past he survived the literal holocaust he was Jewish he was put in Auschwitz and it plays a factor in his psyche moving forward now we're going to jump into episode six Xavier and Lilandra I believe her name is they are intending to get married and they've always had an interest ever since uncanny x-men number one 17. Also, Xavier's gold armor that you see in episode 6 is from Uncanny X-Men number 275, where he was disguised as the Warlord to deceive Deathbird. Storm ends up getting her powers back in this episode as well, similar to how she did in Uncanny X-Men number 226, where it was a mental block for her and she ended up getting them back later than she could have if she would have gotten over that mental hurdle, but that was a big character arc for her, so obviously, boom, she ends up getting her powers back. She also did debuts her black and gold costume, her original costume from Giant Size X-Men number one. Now we're gonna hop into episode seven. Nightcrawler officiates Gambit's funeral. Gambit obviously died in episode five during the Genosha incident. I got you Zeus, Genosha incident. And if you don't know this about Kurt, AKA Nightcrawler in the comics, he is a devout Catholic. He is a respected Catholic priest as well. So this was a cool little nod and Easter egg to kind of his upbringing and how he he views life because also in the comics he literally tries to start his own mutant religion. The facility later on in the episode that Rogue is seen attacking is overseen by General Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, longtime foe of the Hulk. This once again expands on the universe, potential animated Hulk series, potential Hulk cameos that we see. We know Morph turns into him later on in the season. Emma surviving was literally ripped from the pages of the comics. Her mutation was taken directly from X-Men number 116. She was able to turn into the diamond and she was able to survive 
of the rubble falling on top of it because of a mutation and it the scene itself was literally ripped from x-men number 116 if you don't know as well now you do thanks you got lucky nightcrawler and rogue are siblings nightcrawler is the biological son of mystique while rogue was adopted by mystique to be a mutant criminal for her they refer to the, each other throughout season one as siblings now we're going to get into episode eight kate's coffee foreshadows kitty pride does exist in x-men 97 obviously we know in the comics kate moves back to chicago and becomes a barista hinting at the kitty pride involvement we also get to have a peek into bastion's childhood room where we get to see x-51 a toy of him he is an avenger he is a member of the agents of shield and he's also a massive x-men ally in the comics we get to see nightcrawler's reasoning why he uses swords but do you know why he's usually depicted with a rapier or some kind of sword like weapon it's because in the comics he is a massive fan of pirate swashbuckling movies he's a big fan of it he feels as though he wants to be a pirate himself which is a pretty sick little tidbit that now you guys get to know due to episode 8 we also towards the end of episode 8 get to see x-men villains such as silver samurai and omega red reacting to the emp that magneto sets off to shut down the entire world this is a nod to they might be potential big players later on now we're diving into episode 9 we dive in with cyclops joke about black leather if you watch the original 2000 x-men live action film they joke about tights they basically say what do you expect tights well the show gives it back to him a little bit and they say what do you expect black leather when they're talking to cable about his new suit and he kind of shrugs it off and says whatever to it we also get the depiction of the blue team and the gold team now we know that the blue team is from the adjective list let me get that right adjective list comic titled x-men well the gold team is from uncanny x-men now blue team i will have you know the blue team is cyclops the gold team is storm so storm's gold team uncanny x-men blue team cyclops is x-men also the finale is loosely based on the fatal attractions arc especially the 1995 x-men number 25 where the x-men go to asteroid m to fight magneto and magneto turns around enraged and rips the adamantium out of wolverine's skeleton which just like in the show is depicted well in the comics and they basically take the page right from the comic and put it into the show now we get into episode 10 we're going to start off with bastion's new look that comes from the uncanny x-force appearance that he had omega red crimson dynamo and dark star are all russian villains that we do see in episode 10 fighting the sentinels we also get to see psylocke who is usually a part of the x-men but in episode 10 we actually see her in a different setting she is with the team alpha flight which is a government funded Canadian team which if you didn't know in the comics Wolverine was a part of Alpha Flight before he joined X-Men being a Canadian and one of the final things that I want to talk about there's two names in his portfolio basically and it's kind of blacked out it's kind of tough to see but it's Ian I don't want to mispronounce your name so I'm not going to say it and Michael Fassbender those are the two live action actors that played Magneto in the past all in all those are some of the coolest easter eggs that I saw throughout season one of X-Men 97 on Disney plus if you're watching this and you haven't seen it i don't know why but go watch because it really deserves it hopefully this means that marvel was trying to get back on track and they're starting to learn that maybe less is more in the long run let's hope so like always have a good one guys this is lucky i'll see you guys in the next one